Tonight we have uh, the first session uh, is Founder's Journey, uh, and I'll introduce uh, our moderator uh, for that, and then we'll have a break, and we'll have, I think, one pitch at the break, and the um, TAs are going to tell you a little bit about the 100K competition, and then after that, um, I'll do legal issues for the rest of the evening, bore you to death on that, uh, although there'll be no charge, so you're in good shape. So to start off the uh, founder's journey, the moderator is Ken Zolot. Ken is a longtime serial entrepreneur. Uh, I've known him for, gosh, I don't know how many years? A couple of decades. A couple of decades. I'm going to let him tell you what he's doing, because he's always doing something new and interesting, and I never can keep up with it. So with that fantastic, oh, and by the way, your compensation has tripled again. Excellent. Uh, uh, so with that brief introduction, Ken, take it away. All right. Thanks, Joe. Good evening, everybody. Um, before I talk about my panelists and myself, I, I would like to point out that you're in, a, you're in good company in, in the room here, um, starting with, with Joe and Yost, and even with each other. Uh, if, you, if you look around and think about who's in this room uh, and think about where you might all be in a few years, it's always fun to come back and have people come up to me and say how they, they came up with their business idea in this class or they met in this class. Uh, I sometimes uh, nickname this where Sergey met Larry. You've all heard the legend of Sergey and Larry meeting each other at Stanford and going on to, to, to found Google. Um, this is where Sparks happen. And you know, we talked about what's a really compelling technology out there or what's a really interesting problem to solve. I tend to start with the people, which we'll get into a little more in a minute. Um, the two people I want you to meet tonight are on stage here are Richard and Elise, who I will get to in a moment. Um, I'm going to give about uh, 10, 15 minutes of intro remarks, and then I'm going to let them each talk about their journeys, which um, by choice are very early on. Um, these are still active grad students um, who are working on their PhDs um, and working with technology that looks very promising. Um, Elise has already founded a company, which she'll tell you about. Richard has not yet founded a company, so you get to kind of see the continuum of where you go with the new technology and how you get it out the door. Um, let me tell you just a little bit about myself. I began life as a computer scientist and a coder. I um, was also at a thing called MIT Project Athena here about 30 years ago, which built a lot of uh, internet infrastructure like software and distributed computing um, frameworks. And from that spawned a few startups of my own and did some enterprise computing and some cybersecurity startups. That kind of got me a specialization into the financial services industry. I spent a lot of time doing information technology on Wall Street um, and then came back here to teach in about 1999 and have been teaching for a couple decades. And then a few years ago, I also got invited to teach at the Berkeley College of Music. They came to me and said, given that you know how to teach entrepreneurship to engineers, you think you could also teach the musicians? Is, the, is there something about the way engineers approach looking at startups that could be useful for musicians? And as I don't need to tell you, the music industry is going through massive disruption, and it's hard to earn a living as a musician or any artist. Um, so it's a really fascinating question. And also looking the other way, what do musicians and artists know that we as technology people would be well advised to know um, how to how to improvise, how to read an audience, how to put an ensemble together, how to deal with adversity. A lot of the things I teach in my entrepreneurship classes could be a music curriculum if you rephrased it ever so slightly. So uh, that's my way of saying I like bringing unlikely collaborators together and looking for connections where they're least likely to exist. And that's a lot of what I do in my teaching here. Uh, some of my recent electives have been in virtual reality and storytelling. Um, I've worked with the MIT Solve organization on entrepreneurship in the developing world. Um, so if any of that interests you, approach me afterward. I put my email up at the beginning. I'm easily Googleable um, at zolot at mit.edu. And I love talking to students about new ideas, so don't hesitate to reach out. So you've probably all heard variations of this throughout the last couple of days. Um, i just like to start by briefly framing the core ingredients of a successful startup. Uh, almost everyone who comes to me from MIT starts by telling me what it is. They've got some things, some box full of springs and wires that they shake around and it does something magical, um, which is great. And then, of course, the next question from that, 
is, okay, who cares? You, you know, you got some springs and wires that do remarkable things. What are you gonna do with those to solve the world's problems? Or who is it out there who's gonna wake up one morning in pain and then you're gonna show up with your box of springs and wires and their life is gonna be better? Um, how are you gonna get their attention? How many of those people are there? How do they make buying decisions? The finding your customer discussion you had on Tuesday with my friend Bob Jones is very much about the, the kind of who cares part of this. And then the third key ingredient is, is why us? Why the team? Like sometimes someone will come into my office and they won't tell me about their box of springs, but they'll say, oh, my roommate and I, we've been working together since we were three years old and we each just won Nobel Prizes and we've got Jeff Bezos who's gonna be on our board and I'm kind of making stuff up. Obviously no one tells me a story at that level, but sometimes just someone tells me about such a compelling collection of collaborators that I think, oh wow, this is potentially interesting. These are really talented and connected people who are probably gonna do something no matter what it is and no matter what market they're going after, these are people I really believe in. And, and that's kind of where I like to start on the, on the why us piece, the, the, and I would make this personal for why you as an individual founder. I think most good companies are teams at the beginning, so that's why I use the plural us. But the why us part uh, is where I find the most interesting questions. And, and I've asked our guest tonight to talk a little bit about um, their personal journeys as well um, as the technology they're working with and the market they're going after with the technology. Um, and there's so many different reasons to start a company and there's so, so many different personality types of founders. You often don't talk about that a lot. It's really tempting to spend a lot of time getting the technology to work and getting the market figured out and getting your pitch just right. But understanding the dynamics between your team members and yourself, pretty much every crisis consultation I have with a startup that's in, in flight and I get an email or a call from a student I've mentored and they say, oh my God, can I come talk to you about my startup? It's in flames right now, we got a big mess. And it's never that the technology doesn't work because they're smart technologists. They can fix it if the technology doesn't work or they'll find something else. And it's rarely that the customers aren't buying it because they're determined enough that they'll find different customers or they'll change the product so that it's better suited to the customer. But it's almost always, oh my God, my roommate and I hate each other now and we thought we were gonna co-found this company, but we can't stand each other. Or my roommate's cousin just moved to town and wants to join the company and I don't like the person and what am I gonna do? So it's, it's almost always some weird human interpersonal dynamic thing that trips up early stage companies. Um, at least the ones that I wind up hearing about. Um, and so I tend to like to look at that early on. Um, the first tool for looking at that is, uh, it's, it sounds a little corny, but it's the mirror. Uh, I think there's a lot of self-reflection and self-introspection um, involved in understanding why you're doing this and what you want out of it. You know, the popular press likes to glorify these famous tech founders, Elon Musk or Bezos or Gates or Jobs or Drew Houston of Dropbox, or I'll throw in a, an MIT name. And um, this notion of a, of a sort of lone founder who came up with something in his or her dorm room and then built this multi-billion dollar company that he or she is still running, that's such a weird and rare thing to have happen. I mean, those names I just named, if I were to keep going to name famous tech founders who are still running their companies, like I named maybe four or five, I could maybe stretch to come up with four or five more. I probably couldn't name many more than 10, and there's seven billion people on Earth, and I can't name more than 10 who've successfully started and run a major technology company. So that suggests that if that's your aspiration to become sort of a heroic, um, famous founder, um, you might wanna think twice about that. Now, I don't wanna discourage you, you might pull it off, but understanding what are all the junctures along the way that you might explore um, and why you're really in it um, is, is, I think, a really useful thing to do. Um, and just to, to kind of have fun with some of the language of, of the title Joe and Yost came up with for the class. Uh, you know, he's talking about the nuts and bolts and startups. There are a lot of different size and shape components that go into building a company. And being able to look at yourself and talk to your friends, go for psychotherapy, go for a walk in the woods, whatever you have to do to really get a look at, at how you tick and how that jives with your founders. Um, I, as Joe mentioned, I title my talks often, actually the title of my class is the founder's journey. Um, the reason I call it a journey um, 
is because I think of this as a quest, an odyssey, a way of taking agency for your life. I think that's the ultimate joy of this. Um, whether you become rich and famous or build something that's going to cure, cure malaria or whatever it is you think you're going to do, um, that's almost secondary. I think being able to recognize that the center of gravity for your destiny lives within yourself and that as an entrepreneur, you can really control um, your path in a way that a lot of other people can't. That doesn't mean you're your own boss either. As an entrepreneur, ironically, everyone is your boss because you're accountable to every customer and investor and, and partner. Whereas if you're just punching a clock in a factory, you've got one boss and you can go home at night and forget about him or her. So I don't think it's about being your own boss, but I think it's about having a sense of an ability to propel yourself forward. Um, and again, going back to why you're doing this, this intention and source of propulsion and higher calling. That's the trait I see most in successful entrepreneurs is they really seem to get that. There's a certain unstoppability. And people ask me like, what do I look for when I see a pitch from a founder? And it's rarely a, a breakthrough technology. It's rarely a giant market. It's almost always something in the sparkle of the eyes or in the soul of the founder. I know this person's gonna get something done. I don't know what it is but I believe in the way they believe in themselves. Um, I'm gonna skip that. So I'm gonna talk a little bit about um, um, some mythology and also on some numbers, and then, we'll, um, and then I'll, I'll turn it over to my panelists. So on mythology, one of the reasons I call this the founder's journey as well is because of a, of a landmark book by Joseph Campbell, which doesn't have anything to do with startups, but has a lot to do with human adventures called The Hero with a Thousand Faces. Um, and he coined a thing called the hero's journey, which he pointed out that pretty much every hero in the history of humanity, when name your religion, a religious icon or, or some, some general that everyone celebrates, um, almost every hero in, in the history of humanity has gone through a journey. Um, and I won't spend a lot of time on this, uh, and it's a wonderful book, and if you just type Joseph Campbell, hero's journey, there are thousands of blog posts about this. Um, about someone, and, and most movies, most adventure movies, you know, Alice in Wonderland or Wizard of Oz, where someone's minding their own business, wandering around, and get called to adventure. All of a sudden, something happens and their world changes. And then all kinds of weird stuff happens, and they kind of have to go through a cycle of near death and temptations, and they find friends and foes and battle it out. And at the very end, this is a cycle because they come back triumphant and come back home. So, you know, Frodo getting back to the Shire at the end of, of Lord of the Rings is a critical part of that story. Actually, Sam getting back is the more critical part for you, Lord of the Rings fans, because Frodo actually didn't make it all the way home because he was too, too banged up by the journey. But coming home wiser and bringing your wisdom back to your people is a key part of this journey as well. Um, it, it seems a little weird, but it's, it's a really interesting way to, to plot the arc that you're going to have to go through as a startup founder. And it's this great resource if, when you want to study human nature and the triumphs and failures that humans have been through over thousands of years. And, and remarkably, pretty much every culture all across the world from every era in time has followed this almost exact blueprint of celebrating heroes and people who do extraordinary things. So that was a mythology. I'll set that aside for a minute. Now let me show you some numbers, um, which are courtesy of my friend Noam Wasserman. So when I said you should look in the mirror or go take a long walk or see a psychiatrist, that's sort of squishy stuff. Figuring out who you are and why you're doing this can be a hard thing to, to get your hands around. So that's why I turned to Noam, who's done a lot of really rigorous work around understanding founders' intentions and the way founders get through tricky situations. I'm hoping that you all got to click through, those of you who were diligently doing your homework got to click through the link that Joe and Yo sent. There was a reading packet. They all get the links to the reading packet or the articles. Um, the, the article that I sent was a summary of Noam's work, um, which is a sort of shorter version of his uh, recently published book called Founder's Dilemma, Anticipating and Avoiding the Pitfall Falls That Can Sink a Startup. Um, the reason I like this is that it's all about the founder and the, the decisions you have to make. It's, it's not about debugging technology or sizing markets or any of that stuff. And one of the, and he does, he did a lot of quantifiable research uh, where he interviewed lots of companies and looked at histories of lots of companies. 
Um, and one of the most interesting pieces was causes of failures in venture-backed startups. Um, and it was kind of what I was saying a minute ago about the people I hear from with problems are almost always people problems. Um, and, and sure enough, the data bears this out. 65% of failures in venture-backed startups, if you ask what went wrong, if you do a post-mortem, they'll say, we didn't get along, we didn't communicate well, we didn't clearly establish roles and responsibilities and rewards. Um, and, and so that kind of drove him to de dig deeper into this. Um, I said roles, rewards, and relationships quickly, but he dives into that in, in major chapters of his book. So sitting down with you, I mean, you might be best friends with your roommate and say, yeah, let's go start a company together. We'll both do everything together and we'll be equal in everything. That's a little naive. In fact, there's some investors or attorneys, if you go to them and say, we're gonna do our company with a 50-50 split, they'll say, no, you're, you're deceiving yourself. Eventually, one of you is gonna be more important and one of you is gonna be the boss. Why not have that argument now and figure it out then have to resent later that one of you is doing more work than the other? There are times when 50-50 splits can work, but um, having the conversation and being explicit about the fact that you wanna do that um, is, uh, is key. And most of the team tensions revolve around one of these three things. Um, this is just the um, number of teams that are intact as the venture continues. Um, and obviously on day one, it's 100% intact. Um, and, and after 100 months, many of, most, many of them are down to 25% to of their founders. And those are um, founded with friends. The blue and red lines aren't, aren't properly marked, I apologize. One is whether you found with friends or whether you found with strangers. Interestingly, founding with strangers is more stable. But that's because you, don't, um, you haven't read his book. If you've read his book, and I don't get a commission on his book, by the way. <laughs> if you've read his book, um, you're more likely to survive. Oh yeah, they are labeled there, I just hadn't advanced. Um, one of the reasons founding with friends is so, so dangerous um, is that when you like someone, um, now a lot of people around here are abrasive and like to yell at each other, so maybe this isn't true at MIT, but most people try to be polite to one another and they don't want to hurt their friend's feelings or a blood relative where they might have a really uncomfortable Thanksgiving dinner if they have a knockdown, drag out fight with a person. So people tend to not want to confront problems with their good friends. Now there's some cases where siblings can pull this off because they're so good at fighting. The Collison brothers that founded Stripe, by the way, Patrick was an MIT freshman and dropped out. There, there are plenty of cases of relatives that have pulled this off, but siblings, spouses um, tend to make bad co-founders um, not only is the likelihood of confronting each other about what we're calling here elephants in the room problems, the likelihood is lower, and what's more, the emotional damage to you if the relationship blows up is higher. So that's sort of a, a toxic brew there on the left side of the, the chart. Whereas if you found with acquaintances or, or past coworkers, um, you're more likely to develop that ability to spar in a healthy way around the company. So the other good framework that um, Professor Wasserman talks about is the, um, the Richer King framework, which he's, um, he's renamed to Rich or Royal because he didn't want to seem uh, gender insensitive. I actually think King's a good nickname for any gender leader and, and King's a little snappier, so I'll, I'll stick with Richer King. But um, the, and I'll give you a quick math quiz on that. Um, would, uh, let's see a show of hands. How many in the room would, and this is kind of stupid because it's, it's the identical answer, but if you were forced to pick one of these, would you rather have 100% of $5 million or 5% of $100 million? How many would rather have A, 100% of $5 million? How many would rather have B, 5% of $100 million? Interesting, a little more asked for, or went for B. Um, when you interview founders um, who were in this study, um, you were exactly right, the ones who, who picked B. Though um, this was the, the way I framed it wasn't completely um, wasn't completely representative of, of what you face as a founder because the reason why the people um, pick five percent of a hundred million more is because they want to go after a grand slam and they think it's a hundred million now and it's going to be a billion tomorrow and then ten billion a week from now. So they really see growth and size as what they're after and they don't care if they own a giant chunk of it. They would rather have a smaller piece of a bigger pie. Um, some people want to be in charge of their destiny. And some people are doing this, they don't need to buy yachts or private jets, they don't want to be on the Forbes richest people list. 
if they can earn a couple million dollars a year and live very comfortably, um, that's a great life for them. And they don't have to be on the front page of newspapers, but they don't want to deal with jerks. <laughs> and so they say, look, I don't want to have all these weird partners and investors telling me what to do and how to grow my company to a trillion dollar valuation. I want to be 100% in, in charge of my little island. And that's a perfectly valid way to found a company. The problem is when you have people with mixed styles in the same company and they don't know it and they're going in different directions. So that's another key um, discussion you have to have with your co-founders. Um, and, um, and, and this is sort of the two by two grid that shows the, the trade-offs there. Um, most people think they're gonna get to the upper right quadrant. They're gonna be able to retain control of their baby and their baby's gonna get really big. That almost never happens. Most people wind up in one of the two boxes in one of the two yellow boxes. And, and the question is, which would you be happier in? Um, because you're gonna have to give up control to get the company really big. Classic example of this, especially for a young technical founder who's never run a company before. And we saw this happen somewhat disastrously with Steve um, Scully in Apple. I don't know if you remember that story when they fired Steve Jobs and brought in, quote, a professional CEO, because they said Jobs was sort of this zany inventor who was in over his head and they needed professional management to run the company. It didn't work there, but that happens in almost every venture-backed high-tech startup. The investors and the money people think, yeah, you were a cute kid and you got the thing to work in a lab and you got it from zero to 10, maybe you even got it from 10 to 100, but now we gotta go from 100 to a million. So I gotta bring in some suit from a Fortune 500 company who's done this a million times, who's gonna take over. And in order to attract that suit from the Fortune 500 company, I have to promise that guy or gal a significant chunk of your company. And in reality, your company's not gonna be worth anything unless you bring in this person to run it for you. So you really need to surrender a lot of your stock and give it to this new person coming in. And a lot of times that's the right decision. That's the rich path. If you say, fine, I'll back off. I don't need to be CEO. I don't need to run this thing. Bring in some suit from a Fortune 500 company. Let that person have the bulk of the equity in the company. I'll just sit back and collect my paycheck here and hold on to some of my founder's stock. Um, that founder's stock gets really valuable if the ex outside management does a really good job. It's a really tough emotional process to go through. To be honest with you, I personally um, failed at that a number of times myself, which is why I'm enjoying teaching here. Um, I sort of went for the king part, if you will. I'm king of a, a classroom of 20 or 30 people every semester and I don't have to have an equity stake in it or worry about arguing with lawyers and investors. And, and I did reasonably well in some of my earlier startups that, that I can kind of um, do this as a semi-retirement. But I, didn't, I decided that I didn't really have the, uh, the grit in my stomach to, to go through all that slugging it out to try to argue with these people who want to build giant companies. Do I see a hand up? Do you have a question? Succeed in both areas. Well, I mentioned a few of those names. Obviously, Gates. Um, Drew Houston's one of my favorite because he's an MIT alum who's still running Dropbox, though he's got a lot of pressure. He did his roadshow for his initial public offering, and before they went out to do that, a lot of people were saying, are you sure you want this? Do you want us to bring in a professional CEO? Um, the Collison brothers who are running Stripe. Um, another great MIT story that went the other way is the company Quizlet, which many of you know, which is run by a guy named Andrew Sutherland who wrote this when he was a teenager um, in high school and tried to run the company for a while and eventually brought in professional management is doing way better now. Um, he was a, a superb coder and a brilliant guy, but realized that he didn't want to do this nonsense, that he wanted to write code. He didn't want to sit around and argue with people about contracts and where you get office space and, and you know, how you deal with getting sued and all this crud you have to deal with when you're running a big company. Um, he just wanted to write code, which he was really good at, and that he could help the company best by stepping back. Um, so this is, um, this is sort of the, uh, the table of con contents of the whole Wasserman framework, that each time you have to go through one of these forks in the road about what are my values, what are the values of the people around me, um, picking your, your core founders and figuring out when to found the company, um, figuring out your source of capital, figuring out who you want to take money from, who you want to bring on as your early hires, um, how you want to really grow and scale the company. And then finally, when you want to exit the company, when you want to sell it, um, if you want to sell it, or if you want to keep it, 
Uh, and there are all kinds of cases where, um, like when, when Google bought YouTube, um, that seemed really weird at the time. And YouTube was a nice little company that was growing well. They could have said, no, we don't want to get entangled with Google. And Google convinced the YouTube founders, look, Google is a juggernaut. We've got global reach. We're going to keep growing. Join us. Put your platform together with us. You'll wind up doing a lot better than for you to have to go out and build all the infrastructure that we've already built. This is way more prevalent in biotech companies, where a few scientists come up with a really promising drug, and they get a few of them to market. And then Pfizer comes along and says, look, we've got hundreds of thousands of sales reps all over the world selling drugs. Do you really want to build up that infrastructure yourself? Wouldn't you rather just sell your company to us and let us push your drug through our pipeline? Yes? EdTech. Um, EdTech's really tough. I don't have a lot of, and I mentioned Quizlet, which is, uh, I guess, an example of EdTech. Um, there are some giants in the publishing industry and textbook in EdTech where acquisitions make sense. I think EdTech is still a really um, undefined market right now. I think we have a long way to go. And uh, by the way, one of my many um, hats here is part of our Office of Open Learning here, which is MIT's own EdTech startup where we run open courseware and some other things. And we're running it inside MIT and in partnership with edX um, because we don't see a really viable commercial partner yet or a really viable for-profit venture. Uh, I think education is really a, a dicey uh, field right now. So I, I don't have great answers for you about ed tech. But I know lots of people um, who we could talk to together about that and lots of people who are doing ed tech ventures. There's a, uh, an initiative in Boston called Learn Launch, which is sort of a little seed fund and conference, which you, you're nodding as though you know about it already. But that's sort of a nice hub of ed tech initiatives. Um, also, um, just this is the last slide on Wasserman's study. Um, motivation, why are people doing this? This kind of looking in the mirror and figuring out why do you want to found a company? Um, it, and he interviewed as a control group a bunch of people who have regular jobs in big companies as opposed to entrepreneurs. And this particular slide is based on gender split and for 20, 29-year-olds. He did it well on all kinds of other biographic and, and ethnic and, and very other racial divisions. It's really fascinating to see what makes people tick and, and why they want to do a startup. Um, and it, it's not to show you that there's any one right answer or that even you should care what the number one is. But the point is, there are lots of different reasons why people want to do startups. And there are all kinds of people out there in the world. And knowing who you've got on your team and which you are is a really important thing before you get started. So I want to shift to two of our student examples because these two folks are, are largely lone wolves at the moment. Elise has a co-founder. And we'll ask her to tell you about how she got the co-founder. Um, Elise is the one who's already dived in. Um, Richard is just getting started. He's got a promising technology. And the reason I like these two, since we're at MIT here, they're both doing something where there's some really interesting science in a lab that they have been working on themselves. And that's been their PhD work. And their advisor in the lab here who they're working on their PhD work has been deeply involved in this technology as well. I mean, you might dream up this really interesting dating app and decide you're going to write some code and release it. And it has nothing to do with interesting new technology. But you just figured out a fun way to arrange the fonts and colors on a website. And, launch a successful dating app. And you might be able to do tremendously well at that. Um, and I'm not saying that's not a worthy pursuit. But my point is, as long as we're at MIT, let's take a look at some really interesting um, stuff going on in some of our labs and talk about how that turns itself into a startup. And that's why I've got these two um, fine representatives. So Richard is going to start. Um, he's working in print and electronics. And then Elise is going to talk about AeroShield and um, we'll have plenty of time for Q&A and, and discussion along the way. So with that, I'm going to hand this to Richard. And, uh, welcome, Richard. Um, so thank you. I found I have to click that thing twice sometimes. OK. Uh, so today, I'll be talking to you about um, kind of my thoughts on bringing the technology that I do here day to day in MIT. Uh, which is flexible solar cells um, to sort of a more commercial scale. Um, to start a little bit, oh, these two, no? I can just click. Uh, so just a little bit about me uh, to get to know me a little bit. Uh, I'm American. I'm from Connecticut, uh, about two hours south from here in a place called Hamden, Connecticut. It's right outside New Haven where Yale is. Um, up until about 13, my family was blue collar. 
Um, so my dad uh, worked on a factory floor. Uh, at 13, uh, the company sold, and he got promoted, and so that's why that ended. Um, but I grew up around a lot of small business manufacturing in the area. New Haven's kind of known for that. Um, my first part-time job was actually in a wood shop, and um, because of that um, and sort of the cheapness of it, I very early on was in Cub Scouts and then went through the whole Boy Scouts thing, um, which I only mentioned because uh, it got me really interested in the environment pretty early on. Um, in 2015, I graduated from Rensselaer Polytech Institute. It's in Troy, New York, right outside of Albany. It's also an engineering school. My degree was in materials engineering. Um, 2015, I came here. I graduated with my master's in 2018. Uh, the W program's joint, so you do a master's and a PhD. And so now uh, I'm in the midst of my PhD. I have about a year, year and a half left, and I work on thin films and thin films electronics, mostly printing technologies. Um, what got me really interested in entrepreneurship to begin with was actually an undergrad. I worked for this company uh, called Thermo Aura. Uh, they were uh, they classified themselves as an energy and nanomaterials company. They worked on thermoelectrics. If you know what that is, you apply voltage and one side gets hot and one side gets cold. Um, but you can also run them in reverse. So if you have a hot and a cold thing, then you make electricity. And they, their claim to fame is that they could uh, generate these nanocrystals and then make much higher efficiency thermoelectrics. Um, I was there for three years, uh, on and off, full time for two summers with them. I was actually their first employee, so I worked with the grad student, and then he hired me uh, right as soon as he uh, offshot from the school. And what was really nice about working with them was that I was lucky enough to attend a lot of the board meetings uh, very early on. So I saw how um, the CEO, his name's Rudvik, he uh, sort of acquired the sort of initial VC uh, backing as well as partnerships within the school. And I always thought that was very interesting. And so, unfortunately for him, uh, the reason why I left is I got really excited to do that kind of stuff. And so, um, but decided that for a materials scientist as I was, uh, you could really only um, be an entrepreneur in hard tech if you had a PhD, or at the very least, it really helped. <laughs> so that's really what brought me to grad school. Uh, 2014, uh, in undergrad, I decided to come here. I started working for Vladimir Bulovich, who at the time was the Dean of Innovation, is now the director of MIT Nano. Um, my undergraduate project for the one semester I was here uh, was these MIT solar sunglasses. It's a different technology than I work on now, but it's in the demo. It was in the infinite for a very long time. I don't know if anyone saw them. Um, I came in as grad school, was in the Tata Center for Technology and Entrepreneurship mostly focusing on how to bring green energy to developing nations. Uh, the status quo right now is you develop your country with 30 technologies and then transfer over to solar and wind and whatnot. Um, but how could you do it from the onset? Um, I ended that in 2017, and then from then on till now, I've been mostly working in manufacturing. So roll-to-roll, uh, -roll, print electronic stuff. Um, at the start of 2019, I started having some pretty good success in research, and I started thinking, well, how can I gain additional experience in the entrepreneurship world uh, outside of just general technology and development? And so I tried to get myself involved with the community around here a little bit more, and I started working in a company called Kabotics. They're at the MIT Engine right now. Um, they work on AI, machine learning, to try to speed the timelines for material science and thin film development. Um, just as a little anecdote, uh, it takes about 15 to 20 years for new materials to enter the market in an equitable way. And a great example of that is OLEDs. Um, the first physics demonstration of an OLED was in 1960s. Um, the first thin film demonstration was in 1983. And the first actual OLED TV in the market was in 2007. Uh, so that's almost 50 years of uh, research and development before it actually became a product. Um, and for there, I, I was really just hoping to how can I uh, figure out how to do uh, fast turnaround times and best practices for, for this kind of work in a startup. Um, opportunity never comes linearly, and probably about a week after I started Kabotics, uh, I got an offer to work at a venture capital firm as an analyst. Um, I actually still do. I work part-time, uh, 10 hours a week. Um, so far, Partners focuses on uh, materials and clean tech, bio, and AI. Uh, and mostly technologies from MIT, Harvard, and the University of Rochester, where the partners have connections. And so um, I took the opportunity. I really wanted to see and judge how other people were doing their business plans and kind of what uh, financing institutions thought were good ideas and how to get money. Um, 
And so with a little bit of my experience, I don't think I have as much to say on this as the people in this room, but I really think startups are like building a house. Um, to build a house, uh, you need land, and that land uh, is comparable to your technology. It's really the space that you have freedom to operate. You obviously can't work on something you don't know anything about. Um, on that land, you need a foundation, and I really think that's the business plan because it's really the thing that supports everything else. You have a support structure. That's really your employees. They're the ones who translate customers down to your business plan, uh, help you make money. And then you have the exterior. And the best way I can describe this is that nobody really wants to come into your house if it looks really bad. And so the exterior is your customer acquisition and how important that is. Houses are only houses if people live in them. <laughs> um, and I really think the founders and the leadership team are, uh, can be represented like a family. I did this by design. Uh, in our, my job at Safar, we often describe founding teams as families, um, mostly because we were looking for that kind of very strong overlap. Um, and they're the people that live, maintain, plan, redesign, do all these things to the house. Um, as Ken was talking about, I'm nowhere near that. Um, I'm basically just a guy in a field trying to plan out where to put the foundation. So uh, let's talk a little, about, a little bit about the technology that I work on. So, um, like I said, I work in printed solar. Um, the main thrust for solar is that uh, we have a lot of it. Uh, every day on Earth, we get all the energy we need for an entire year globally, so um, over the course of one hour. So we have a lot, a lot of this resource, um, which is great um, because it means that it can be very cheap. Uh, it's also geopolitically uh, everywhere. Uh, obviously, the sun shines everywhere. Um, and so everybody can use it. Um, it's not resource constrained. We don't have some countries that have more of it. We don't have some countries that have less of it. Um, there is a little bit of discrepancy, but it actually turns out um, that the countries that have not developed electricity yet have more sunlight, which means that solar is more useful for them. Um, there's been a lot of energy research at MIT, uh, namely through the MIT Energy Initiative. And as an economic guide, how you make solar profitable and equitable uh, comes down to kind of the four simplistic bullet points that I have here. You really need to use um, earth abundant materials. The reason why is you need a lot of solar. Um, it's not a tiny electronic, it's a very large electronic, and so you need something that can scale well. Uh, CapEx becomes a really important aspect. You need, again, a lot of this. So if you can make more for cheaper uh, upfront cost, it ends up lowering the, the energy at the end. Um, if you make it flexible, uh, you can reduce supply chain costs, it becomes easier to install. Um, and then at the end of the day, nobody cares too, too much about solar as a technology and what goes into it. They care about the cheapness of the electricity at the end. Uh, so the levelized cost of electricity is really the main driver. Um, we at MIT uh, and my lab and myself believe that a switch in technology uh, is really what will let us achieve those four bullet points. Um, crystalline silicon is on the left. Uh, I work on what are called thin films on the right. And what makes them better is that they're usually just easier to process. Um, and so they're so easy to process that a lot of people, myself including, have thought about using printing technologies that are some of the fastest uh, manufacturing machines that we know of in the world to actually make solar. And so as an example, this is New York Times College Point Printing Center. Uh, they print about 8,000 newspapers every hour. If you converted that into printing solar technologies, uh, a solar technology is the same as like a color image. It's just multiple layers of a material. Um, you can actually print 23 gigawatts. And to compare that to something, uh, in 2017, China had 51 gigawatts of manufacturing capacity uh, per year. And right now, it's about 100, 150, uh, depending on which estimates you look at. Um, so you can use very uh, sort of traditionally cheap manufacturing techniques to print a lot of solar. Um, we've definitely done this in lab. Uh, this is a video. Uh, it's slow, slower than they would. Um, they would print at College Point, but yeah. So uh, that's the coating head, and then the black stuff is the solar material. Um, if you do a cost comparison with incumbent technologies, uh, we can print these a lot faster, roughly half the time uh, that it would take to print or to manufacture a solar cell in normal means. 
Uh, the cost is comparable. I did a kind of back of the napkin calculation before coming, coming here. Uh, 20 cents a watt using research prices. Uh, at scale, uh, a solar module is 25 cents uh, per peak watt. That's actually lower than estimated because uh, that number comes from Chinese subsidies. Uh, the lifetime's unfortunately not as good as incumbent technologies. Uh, solar lasts about 25 years now, uh, and it's definitely not scaled. But the benefit that we have here at MIT is that uh, this is the, it's a busy chart. It's the research efficiencies of everybody across technologies, but if you zoom into the one that I work on, uh, MIT is actually in the lead. So, um, but that's just the technology. Technology, uh, you know, getting back to the house, it's maybe only one fifth of a whole business. Um, so let's talk about the business. Um, being a little bit more now into the VC realm, I like thinking about um, what you can do with the money and time that you're given. And so I'm going to start with thinking about that. Uh, in my field, it's probably pretty common, uh, maybe at max, to get about five million in your seed round. Um, a Series A, which will come maybe. Uh, maybe about two years later. Series A, uh, that'll come a little bit later, is about 15. Um, series B might be 30-ish, uh, and then after that is growth capital. That's kind of random. Um, but the point is that uh, for me, and I think about this, I think about uh, I maybe only have $50 million to work with at max uh, over the first maybe five to 10 years of development for a potential company. Um, if you look at the market of photovoltaic technologies, it's huge. It's almost not even worth thinking about. Um, it's about 250 billion expected by 2023. Uh, so it's really large. Energy in general is really large. Like I said, it's not even worth thinking about because it's kind of uh, split down. Uh, if you look at uh, if you look at thin film specifically, um, which is the technology I work on, it's about five billion. So again, much lower split. Um, perovskites, which is what I, again, work on uh, in this graph. Uh, blue is the conventional stuff. Uh, orange is the kind of upcoming, and then perovskite is black, and it actually doesn't even show up on the graph because uh, the number is so low. Um, so the whole point of this uh, kind of, you know, initial gloss over of the market assessment is that, well, maybe the market isn't primed for change yet, um, and that other sources of revenue might be needed. Again, we have money and time constraints. Um, so again, going back to kind of the landscape, uh, we have a lot of technology here. I'm not going to talk too much about it, but um, the main core of a potential business is in the material science and the thin films. We have patents on it. Um, we have a lot of, obviously, knowledge and trade secret of kind of how we process stuff. These are all the materials that would go into a device. Um, and so the question is, can this maybe be applied to something else first, and then you can either pivot back or make more revenue uh, prior to doing anything in solar. And so here are two examples of auxiliary stuff um, that my lab has definitely worked on, be included. Uh, this is a transparent display. Uh, just to describe the image, a projector is projecting an image on the curved piece, uh, and I'm actually holding a piece of glass in front, and so it only reflects a specific color. So it's transparent until you project something on top of it. Um, the other image is kind of hard to describe, but it's something I'm pretty proud of. It's a paint that if you paint it on something uh, and that thing has a heavy metal in it, that heavy metal will never leave. <laughs> so um, that's not too much of a problem in the United States, uh, but lead paint is actually ubiquitous across the rest of the world, and so there's an idea uh, that we had where you can just paint this over leaded paint and they won't be as much of a problem as it normally would have been. Um, so potential markets of this technology, um, I'm wrapping up. Um, you could use all of what I've talked about directly for solar. Um, ideally, you might want to sell to residential or industrial uh, because they pay a higher premium. Um, but the initial demo would probably be a lot. Uh, you'd have to manufacture a lot of solar. And with the kind of initial market assessment, you might need to play a lot of tricks to get some sort of uh, customers and revenue stream. The other is licensing. It turns out that there's a lot of printing uh, manufacturing lines in the United States and Europe. A good example is Armour. Um, they want to start printing things of higher value. And so Armour, I've actually lifted it, listed it here, they've started industrial coding and printings. The office printing is their main business, but they've also looked at batteries and 
Uh, they call their solar division our more beautiful light. So you could just license to them and they can do all the manufacturing, but you own the IP uh, and sell them maybe materials. And the other uh, potential market is doing some sort of auxiliary. So uh, something, again, that's related to the core material science and technology of the business, but is easier and higher value uh, than doing a direct solar. So takeaways, um, something I want you guys to kind of maybe think about, because uh, I've been thinking about it, is that success is a combination of the team, the business plan, and the technology. Um, a good business will make the company revenue, that's kind of the end goal. Uh, a good technology and a good support team uh, will allow you to adapt um, as you address customer needs. And a good leadership and founding team uh, will basically make everything run and hum as the business gets started. Um, technology transfer is not always linear. I tell people to try and be creative because um, the research proposal is very different from what a customer might want. Um, and be open to new ideas. Um, I think a lot of times I see people get really stuck in their own specific technology that they really want to see work, but the reality is that uh, the objective is for the business to succeed, not a single idea to be the one. So um, that is all. All right, great. Thanks, Richard. <laughs> maybe, um, maybe just talk for a minute of how you see yourself as a founder. Is this uh, something you want to do, or? Do you want to partner with co-founders? Yeah, I, I mean, I went into uh, my PhD with the understanding that I wanted to work with people and develop technologies that were useful to others. Um, so I always kind of wanted to, to be in a group and, and do this, and so that's, that's kind of why I'm doing it. So the answer is yes, I definitely don't want to do this alone. I want to do this with someone. Um, who is still you know, to be decided, I think. Uh, there's definitely different personalities between uh, academic sort of research and the people that, that I think I could work really well with. Um, Have you, you, well, you're doing this work with a VC, so you're, you're learning a lot of these business skills indirectly, but if you think about, do you need to go learn about all of this business stuff, or would you rather just hire someone to do it for you so you could work on the technical stuff? Yeah, I'm definitely better uh, being in the VC. <laughs> I'm definitely better at being a technologist than I am being uh, on the business side. Mm -hmm. um, a lot of VCs, especially in the hardware world, um, hire analysts who have PhD backgrounds, and so that's kind of why I get to be involved. Um, but a lot of the business decisions are still made by people with MBAs um, because it's more of their bread and butter and the technology, which is what I analyze, is more of my bread and butter. Do you, do you get along with those people? Yeah, yeah. I actually like it a lot. I, I think it's really fun to have that integration. That's key, too, because if you're content doing the technical part and willing to bring in a business partner, um, that, that's often the source of a lot of friction. And, and each of you thinking you're doing 99% of the work and the, only, or the other's only doing 1%. So that'll, that'll be interesting to watch unfold. And there may be a co-founder in this room, for all we know. Um, <laughs> anyone worked in solar before or, or, uh, or in, in any of these nanotechnologies that Richard's been talking about? Um, what do people think? Is he uh, is he on the right path here? You see you see a company coming out of this? Yep. Can I have a question? Yes, please. Well, developing there is a lot of issue in maintenance afterwards. While developing the technology, do you take a look into that, or you didn't have any? Questions? Yeah, I'll just repeat that question if you didn't hear it in the back. And that's a great. I'll paraphrase it by saying it's one thing to build one of them in the lab to put millions of these out in the field and then have to have them run and maybe be maintained, especially in in countries without great infrastructure. Um, so what's the path from having a couple work in the lab to having them work at scale all over the world? Yeah, um, that's a great question. Um, it's a very big unknown. I don't think there's a good translation from uh, research scale small stuff to like real world long time scales. Um, so that is a risk. I, I mean, I think that's a risk for anyone in this space. Um, there's actually a, if you know of the company, there's, there's a company called Nano Solar. It's out of business now, but the, uh, the founder was very good at documenting kind of the trials and tribulations of the company. Uh, and that's effectively the reason why he thinks the business died, was that 
uh, the initial development was very successful. They got a lot of money. They got about 500 million in investment. Uh, but their core technology just didn't end up lasting to customer needs in, in the field. And um, he at least thinks uh, that it's a, it's a very tough problem for a startup to have when you don't have fast turnaround times. Um, so I've kind of taken that a little bit to heart. Uh, I try my best in lab to do um, like faster iterations of things and maybe develop techniques for that. Um, but it's definitely hard. And you know, in this framework of um, team technology and market, uh, it seems like in Richard's case, the market is indisputable. I mean, energy is a, a massive problem for the whole world. The technology is pretty much there. It's just going to need a little tweaking to get it out. The team is really where you have to work, both getting yourself at a point where you're ready to take the leap and bringing in, in co-founders. So in almost every pitch you hear, like two out of three of those usually are, are reasonable and you got to work on a third one. So it's interesting to, to look at these and figure out which part do you believe in and which part do you think there's still risk in. Um, you know, is there, is there market risk? Are they really going to buy it if, even if you can make it? Is there technology risk? Can you really make it? Is there a team execution risk? Do you know enough people who are smart enough to just work with you and who are willing to quit their jobs at Facebook and come work for you at a, a speculative energy company and, and, co and come work for you? So um, it's great that you're looking at all of these. And I really admire the, the level-headed way you, you go about thinking about this. Um, so let's let Elise tell her story for a minute. Then we'll let both of them moderate some Q&A with the group. And Elise, I will hand you this. And, That's great. Um, this is perfect. It's the lower arrow that moves them forward. Lower forward. Thank yeah. you. Yeah. You get to shoot it straight from there. All right. Well, uh, thank you for the introduction. Um, so my name is Elise Strobach, and I'm the CEO, founder, and inventor of AeroShield, which will go into what that is. But essentially, it's porous glass that is super insulating. And we put it inside of a double pane window, and we can upgrade all of the windows that we're manufacturing today. So I'm going to start by talking, just kind of taking you through the majority of kind of uh, high-level pitch of, of what AeroShield does, so really what value we're creating in the technology. And then as I get towards the end, I'm going to jump out and get a little bit into my personal journey to get there. Um, so hopefully we'll have the context of the technology and the business, and then I'll talk a little bit about how, how well, everything that brought me to standing here today. So I'm going to start by having you look at this picture. Um, and I'm sure as you look at this, you can see that our buildings have an energy problem. And it's glaringly obvious in red. It's that all of this, in this thermal image, all of this heat is leaking through our windows. And in fact, in the United States, every winter, $20 billion in energy is lost through the glass alone in our buildings. And the reason that this energy loss is so high is because you can imagine thinking of the materials that are transparent, insulating, and affordable. That's a pretty short list. And so we've done a lot in, in industry with uh, taking the strategies that we have as far as we can, but we're really starting to hit limitations. And because of that, when we take a look at the technologies that are available, um, you know, traditionally we think of just a classic double pane, two pieces of glass sealed with an air gap in between. And when we think about how we evaluate this, we think about the thermal performance that we get, which we can measure with this R factor here. So higher numbers, better, right? So most people, 80% of Americans, choose to install this double pane uh, performance level here. And when you compare that to what you could get with, you know, other products, it's really kind of abysmal. You know, we can do more than twice as good by just adding an extra pane of glass. The reason that we're not making those decisions is because you pay for that extra performance. And in fact, um, when we look at the price that a consumer has to pay per square foot, triple pane windows, they have all this great performance, but they still take decades to pay back on that energy investment that you're putting in with that initial cost. And so for that reason, less than 3% of the new windows that are going to homes in North America today are triple panes. We're still tolerating these really high losses. So the question comes, what can we do to fix that? Well, at AeroShield, we think we need a new material to just fundamentally make our windows better. And so this is the basis of the material right here. So this material is glass. But it's glass made up of 95% air that is trapped inside of pores that we've engineered to be so small your eye can't see them anymore. But it's all these tiny little pores that do all the work to make this one of the most insulating materials in the world. So it's actually twice as insulating as air. Um, in addition to that, I spent a good portion of my PhD working on optimizing this material specifically for windows, so understanding the unique nanostructure that allows this material to have these amazing properties. So 
when we take our traditional double pane window and we take a sheet of this, this aero shield material and we simply slide it in place, um, hopefully it goes here, there we go, <laughs> slide right in there, right? We unlock amazing performance. You can actually double the thermal efficiency um, of some windows or make them up to 50% more insulating than what we normally install. Payback periods that are five times faster than before. And we can have a product that's thinner, lighter, less embodied energy. So from the moment it's made to the moment it gets in your home, we can be using less energy. And in particular, this becomes really apparent when we compare this performance to those existing products I showed you before. So I can now have a product that has all this amazing performance, but with a fraction of the cost. So now I don't have to choose between being sustainable, being comfortable in my home, and being able to afford to put windows in my new home. Um, and so in particular, uh, the business model that we've come to be able to achieve this kind of price, this small added, is by actually jumping into the existing manufacturing chain. So we're going to get a lesson on windows today, right? Um, so how they're made today for your residential home is it starts with a glass manufacturer who makes a big sheets of glass, sells those to somebody called an insulated glass manufacturer who cuts them to size and seals them together into an insulated glass unit. And those get sold to entities that we know as Anderson and Marvin and Pella. And they put the frames on them and make them look really pretty and make sure that they get shipped out to your house so they can get installed. With AeroShield, we can simply make our material, uh, sell it directly to these entities that are already sealing these units, get our material in there protected between two panes of glass, and still access all of that great thermal performance without having to reinvent the wheel. We can use the existing infrastructure and the expertise that's been built. And for that reason, this kind of go-to-market strategy, getting this uh, idea out there, means that we can be lower cost, we can be faster to market, we don't have to worry, I don't have to worry about selling windows to homeowners because that's not my specialty, my specialty is making material. Um, and it also means that we can control the manufacturing of this material so that we can have that big energy impact that we want. And in particular, um, we're at this stage now, we're just spitting out of the university, so uh, we're still working on some of the technical barriers, but really we want to start uh, with a market where we can be very successful. And as I showed you before, um, well, triple panes, great thermally insulating, uh, but super expensive. So let's go to a market where they're already installing a bunch of triple panes and create a product that's even better. It's thinner, it's lighter, but it still performs really well. Um, and in particular, in Canada has some really nice um, regulatory advantages. Um, and it also provides us a really nice entry point to target um, potential customers that are already existing in the industry. And this is really just the foothold that we need to be able to bring a new platform, a new way to have a clear insulating material that can be applied to a whole bunch of different applications. So these are just a subset of a couple that we've looked at as very interesting. So think about we need windows in our homes, in our offices. We also need them in... Um, our commercial refrigerators, so you go to the supermarket and you see all those glass doors. Um, solar thermal energy for our homes and businesses. All of these are, are areas that we would like to have AeroShield there making an impact um, as we go. So the question is, is how do you actually get there? Um, so this is a little bit apart, so I'll just kind of give an overview of um, kind of where we're at and, and where we anticipate going, and then I'll dive a little bit more uh, into my kind of personal journey to being here. So. Um, in particular, uh, 2019, really focused a lot on getting foundations. This is my PhD research. Wanted to get that established, but as we went through this, also needed a lot of foundation on the entrepreneurship side. So we went through, did a lot of development. We did, were part of some fantastic programs, some accelerators, the uh, NSF uh, uh, Innovation Core program, um, as well as the MIT Clean Energy Prize. So we took part in all those, so we got this really strong foundation. Um, and that sets us up for our next phase, which is really focused on being able to have a complete product and acquire a customer. Um, and so that's what we'll be going into in the next few years. And then after that, we want to be able to um, actually have a full commercial production launch at the point where you could go into a store and be able to buy AeroShield windows. And then after that, it's always world domination, right? Um, so being able to grow, expand, and, and eventually be able to prove that you know, this sustainable material is cost effective and manufacturable and can be used a lot of different places to have an impact. So now I'm gonna, I'm gonna go back, we'll take it back to the origin story. Um, so when I started at MIT um, almost six years ago now, uh, I was working on a project out of the RPE, which is out of the Department of Energy. So RPE is like advanced research projects with an energy focus. And we were looking for a way to make solar thermal energy more cost effective. 
And so um, uh, department head at the time, Gong Chen, thought, uh, you know, why don't we use this, this new material that's, it's been around for a while, it's called silica aerogel, and it's glass with pores inside of it, and it's mostly solar transparent. You can kind of see from this picture, it's got a little bit bluish color. You can see that it's there along this bottom here. Um, and so he said, well, let's, let's slap this on a, on a hot black surface, put it out in the sun, put some mirrors to concentrate, and we can collect all this hot solar thermal energy, and then we can turn that hot solar thermal energy into electricity and have utility-scale generation. And so we began to learn about this material, develop it, refine it, make it more solar transparent so that we could put it on top because we have a hot black surface that we want to heat up as much as possible. And we have a transparent, highly insulating material. Seems like a perfect match. So we spent um, you know, quite a bit of time really just working on the fundamentals, really getting the material science, all that nitty gritty stuff that you write your full thesis on. Um, and um, through that time, uh, I, I got assigned to really work on the material characterization of this, this aerogel material, which is pretty interesting stuff. Um, and as you can see, like over the course of this, we got better and better and better at making something that wasn't this kind of hazy, they used to call it frozen smoke. Now we had something that was clear, and that was interesting. But unfortunately, solar thermal was not keeping up with the price drops of photovoltaics. And so when you think about utility scale generation, even with the advantages of storage that solar thermal has, which I won't get too much into the weeds there, uh, it just wasn't really cost competitive at the utility scale. So now we had this great material, we were ended up with some pretty good advancements and nowhere to put it. And that was right around the time that I was finishing up my master's and I was looking for a, you know, specifically what my PhD focus would be. Um, and I remember talking with my advisor and I said, you know, I have all this material characterization and I think it's a really cool material. And we, you know, we really have some, some promising early results, but you know, it's solar thermal, I just don't think that's where it's gonna have an impact. So um, during that time, actually, uh, went through, kind of wrote a list of all these application spaces that we could put this material now that, now that we had it. And we made a matrix and uh, you know, ranked things like uh, total market that we could maybe reach, how much impact could we have, um, you know, were there other properties that were gonna limit us from operating in this area? So we ended up with this big, you know, Excel spreadsheet, and we went through, and, and what jumped out was windows. Uh, and so that led to the next, um, the next chapter, which is really the foundations of AeroShield. So, um, was actually wrote a proposal and funded through uh, MIT Deshpande Center for Innovation. Um, so I'd be happy to answer any questions about that, but uh, a great organization, and they took this kind of new budding um, you know, material, this new innovation, and they kind of put me right in the hot seat and said, okay, do your research, do the fundamentals, but also take a look at, at the actual application, the commercialization path, or, or what you're making. Is it actually something people can use, or are you just studying properties because they're interesting? Um, and so through that, I started to get exposed to this kind of entrepreneurial world, and I remember that, um, at one point, uh, the Deshpande Center offered a workshop and they said, come, let us teach you how to talk to people in industry because it turns out that they know the use cases for a lot of these things like windows that you're studying. And um, it was quite painful. I remember having to go to workshops and practice interviewing people and then even worse, knowing that as I was practicing, at some point I was gonna go out and have to talk to strangers. And I was, I was, that, was that was a scary moment because I, you know, I'm introvert, like I wanted to stay in the lab, work on the technology, but I wanted to have the impact. So I knew, I was like, okay, well, we'll give it a shot. So one of the mentors from the Deshpande Center went with me um, to a trade show, to a window building conference, and walked me around and basically um, modeled for me. He went up and, you know, would shake hands and, you know, ask how people are doing and, and showed how really to, to ask the questions and started to ask them interesting questions like, how are your windows made? How do you look at new technologies? What are you looking for? If you could have a new material, what would you want it to do? Um, and that was really the start of a journey into customer discovery. So getting into the application side, understanding, um, finding that problem. So we had this solution, right, this technology, and it was really finding the problem that, that existed and then deciding if we could solve it with this material. Um, and I remember the moment at which I was sh like sold on this entrepreneurial game was, um, it was maybe nine months into, into this um, funding working on this Windows, and. I had been developing, I'd been looking at a lot of properties, thinking about a lot of different things uh, on the fundamental side, and ended up in a conversation on the phone with somebody from the window industry. And in 30 minutes, he gave me information that would have taken me three to six months to sort through. 
Um, and it, it pivoted our development for the material fundamentally. We thought, we have all these amazing properties. Let's just pack them in there. Let's have this window do anything and everything you'd ever need it to do. And it turns out that wasn't the problem that they had. The problem that they had was they needed more insulating materials, but everything that they were looking at sacrificed either on price or visual quality. I don't want to look through a hazy or dirty or colored, colored window, um, or it couldn't scale, or, you know, they just had all these tripping blocks. And so what they needed was really just really insulating, cost effective, and, and really visually clear material. And so that was what I focused on. I worked on that problem and, and throughout that I continued to interview people, get more information, understand how they make windows and who makes those decisions. And um, you know, why is it different that residential windows are made completely differently from commercial? And how come the entities aren't doing both? And all of these um, little pieces that went to build up this expertise so that not only did we know how to make our material, but we knew what kind of material we had to make to solve the problem in the window industry. And that is the point that we're at now is we have this proof of concept material. We have a prototype that we were able to build that met customer expectations because we went out and asked them what they wanted. Um, and so from there, we really did lay the foundations for this, um, this aero shield. And so uh, in uh, September, we incorporated and um, then it, then it was about laying, you know, those foundations for the next step, which, as I mentioned, will be actually um, spinning out of MIT in the next few weeks um, and starting manufacturing. You can see there's me and my co-founder standing with this big piece of uh, equipment that we're going to rent some time on, and we're actually already starting to produce um, some early material. So uh, definitely a lot more ahead on the journey, but a pretty interesting uh, path to get there, and I'm, I'm pretty excited about the future. And I'll just... Uh, Let's take a moment and uh, kind of highlight our team. Uh, so there's myself, who's been working on this material for five and a half years now, um, and, and a particular uh, PhD candidate in mechanical engineering. My co-founder actually came from the lab that I was working in, but he worked in a different area. Um, so just kind of to touch on this, you know, finding a co-founder part of the story, um, I actually took, uh, last fall, took Energy Ventures, which is a fantastic course, um, and pitched my technology. And um, Kyle happened to be uh, taking the course as well. And when he uh, bid for projects to work on, he bid on mine. I'm sure he thought he was going to get an easy time of it because he's like, oh, I've heard about this in my lab. Um, and so from there, uh, along with um, Yvonne, who still helps us out part time, um, we put together this team. And it was the first time on this journey uh, that I had other people who were interested in the commercialization. Because I definitely had colleagues who were interested in the material science. But um, it was really hard to get people to talk about customer interviews in my lab for some reason. Um, so he got into it. And because he had to for the class, he got exposed to this entrepreneurial stuff. And uh, when we got to the end, we had uh, you know, this kind of draft business plan. And we looked at it, and we, we thought, wow, this is actually pretty promising. Uh, what's the next step? So we thought we'd work on it a little more. We did the pitch circuit through MIT, Clean Energy Prize in particular. Um, we did quite well at. Um, and, uh, and from there, it was you know in the preparation for these um, competitions. We got mentorship. We got exposed to the community. Um, you know, we got uh, to see uh, you know, other teams, other technologies, how other people put together presentations, how other people were you know, handling all these challenges that come with uh, entrepreneurship. And it was, it was kind of that point last spring that it really clicked for us. And we went, uh, particularly Kyle and I, we went, we're all in for the next you know, five years. Let's give it a go. And that was the point at which we decided that we would uh, pursue commercialization very seriously. And uh, since then, incorporated and started to put together a lot of foundations. Um, for, for spinning out and put together an advisory board to fill in the gaps that we couldn't find or um, you know, uh, really felt we needed uh, part-time expertise. Maybe not somebody working with us full-time, but somebody we could go ask, you know, somebody who's founded a window company, go ask them, like, what were you thinking? Um, you know, and, and, and go through those kind of things. And the common thread on the team side of things, I'll just say also to uh, Ken's point, really finding that mission before we ever signed any legal documents discussed equity splits, any of that, we all agreed what the mission um, that we were going to have was. And for us, it was, um, it was the impact. And I can just tell you, like, by, by living by that, um, it has made every decision so much easier because when it comes down to understanding your motivations for why you're doing something or should I take somebody's money and give up some of my power if it means that I can have that better impact? I mean, a lot of those pieces that just helps you know who you are and 
and what you're working towards. And so in particular, our focus is, you know, not only being able to, you know, make everybody's home better with better windows, um, but also have a huge energy impact uh, potentially globally. And this is just projections from if we take our material as it is now, hopefully, you know, we'll have significant research and development continuing on throughout the years so that this really helps us get to, um, you know, a cost-effective path for our buildings because it's I think, more than 30% of our energy uses. So something we really have to solve. And so AeroShields is excited to be a part of that solution. So thank you. All right. <laughs> Thank you, Elise. Um, so when you said you're about to spin out of MIT, that means you're going to get physical office space somewhere and, and set up shop there? Yeah, yeah. We actually have, um, uh, there's an incubator space south of Boston where we'll be primarily doing our manufacturing, but we also have um, th uh, a seat at Greentown Labs for the next six months or so, and that'll mm. start, I think, mid-February. Oh, good. She just mentioned Greentown Labs, by the way, which if you haven't heard of, you ought to check out, and it's one of many wonderful places. Excuse me. <coughs> places around here. Um, there are co-working spaces, incubators, accelerators, uh, venture capital funds that host startups, all the different buildings and shapes and collaborators you could work with. There's a whole range of those. It's a big yeah. list, yeah. Um, and are you going to be able to finish your PhD, or is this going to take all your time? I am hopefully almost done. Uh, I defended in December, uh, so I just have to finish, um, you know, like, crossing all the T's, dotting all the I's, and I'll be on the February degree list, so, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it's possible. <I'll> just <laughs> and, you know, when you talked about all the different um, industries you can go into, commercial buildings versus residential buildings, I suppose NASA has special glass on its spacecraft or, you know, any, any, any maybe some consumer product you put in the home where you just have some little thing that you use for a decoration. And when you think of all the places glass is used and, and all the places where this could be useful. Yeah, I, and I think the thing that kind of excites us is, you know, we want to do the hard work of showing it's manufacturable, and that's, you know, the window application we found is a good, a good proving ground for that. Um, but we're also hoping that people will rethink a lot of their devices and um, ways that they uh, approach, you know, thermal insulation. So I work in a heat and mass transfer lab, so that's, you know, why I'm so excited about it. Uh, insulation, but um, yeah, it, I mean, it's we really want to bring a platform that uh, you know opens up a whole new set of possibilities. So, yeah. Good. Anyone worked in this industry before, or looked at glass insulation, or or, or the window industry? Awesome. That's more than I expected. So. <laughs> <laughs> what are um, any any predictions for what she's going to be facing next, or what you would like to see her do next? If you were in her shoes, what would you do? The questions? But what's the hardest <coughs> role? It's a fragile material. What's the hardest part of integrating into the assembly line for an insulated glass unit? Yeah, so this is a fragile material. What's the hardest part about integrating it into an assembly line where there are lots of other materials and fast moving things going on? Yeah, I, I guess I would say it's it's definitely not disrupting their process the way, I mean, it's a conservative industry and we'd like to move fast. And to do that, we've found that it's better to have the window industry on our side wanting to work with us. Um, but they've also had, you know, hundreds, arguably thousands of years of, of glass making history and we have, you know, a short amount of time making our material. So I think really integrating with this high, um, high quality, high level of service, high yield, um, is really our focus because um, you got to solve your problem, your customers' problems, not create more for them. But I mean, we're also a long ways away from integrating into the window line, so I reserve the right to change that and say it's something else later. <laughs> yep. Yeah, yeah. So there's some that this industry is is has a lot of tests established, like industry standards. Like um, there's one company in particular that has their own version of an industry standard test, where if they put a window unit into it basically is a chest freezer that washes it with hot water and UV light for 40 weeks, they will certify it for 20 years. And that's because they've had so many decades of the, the exact same windows in houses for 20 years. They can compare the data. So. We certainly have a lot of work to do, but the good news for us is that there's kind of a roadmap already for new technologies. So 
we have to do it yet, but, um, and also because our material is glass, we're, we're pretty excited about, you know, no UV degradation or thermal stability. Um, so a lot of barriers to cross, but at least that's not really one of them we're concerned about. Yeah. Yep. So I, I don't want to do that. I'm just curious, but I'm a PhD student in mechanical engineering as well. And I have some questions about the synergies you have with these experts. From what I see, you have people that, you know, could be potential competitors as well. And people that, you know, are probably very busy with those competitors. So what kind of scenario do you expect to happen then, not only in the short term or in the long term? Yeah, that was a great question. You might remember the slide she showed about um, this panel of experts that she brought on. When you're assembling your team, in addition to your full-time founders, you want to get advisory board members or angel investors or others who believe in your company and want to be with you. And the point was, some of these people are potentially your competitors. They might not want you to succeed. And how do you know if they're a friend or a foe or how much you want to tell them or, or how friendly they're going to be to you? Yeah, yeah, certainly just like with, um, you know, picking your, your co-founder, um, it, it's definitely like a, a, you have to have a good match of, of personality. So one was, you know, we started by just getting a sense of the industry, so we talked to a lot of people, so we had a good baseline. Um, but then also as we talked with people, there were certain people that clicked. And um, I mean, we're early, so things could turn out differently, but the people that are on our um, advisory board, one, they were not actually competitors with them. Um, so for example, like the window expert, their company makes windows. We could potentially like supply material to them that could go in their windows. That's not actually their, um, they're a very small company serving a very niche market, so they're pretty happy with, with where they're at. But um, like before we formed the advisory board, we had you know very open, honest conversations. We did trial periods first. We didn't just you know meet these people and say, oh, he's got a great resume. Let's stick him on our team, um, because someone can can look really great on paper, but like if you really want to work and get the value out of them, I think it's you know like trial basis is is usually a good way to test things out. So with um, each of these people, with the exception of my advisor, who I just you know worked with for many years. Um, you know, we had a trial period and, and saw the value and made sure it not only was a good fit with my, you know, me as the, you know, founder, but also my co-founder as well. So made sure it was a nice, nice blend. So hopefully that kind of answers your question. Yeah, um, sorry, so they can ask something. I'm also interested in what kind of like relations you have with them. They just advise you, mm. they have equity in the company? Yeah, yeah. the question is, um, yeah. do these people get paid? Do they have equity in the company? And when and how do they, they work with you? Yeah, it, it can vary. Um, these particular that we have listed, we haven't um, we haven't incentivized them at all. So right now it's just kind of um, volunteer basis. Um, you know, I anticipate for some of the advisors that may or may not want to change. Um, there, I mean, like we can get into the details of like advantages, disadvantages of of incentivizing advisors. Um, one argument that I've heard for is that you get. Um, they're more committed, right? If they have a sh if they have a share in the profit, right? They're going to be more motivated, motivated to. Um, bring, you know, whether it's money or connections. Um, in particular, the people that we've put on our team so far are just like genuinely excited about our material and they know that we're very early stage. So we're kind of waiting to have those conversations, formalize that a little bit down the line. Um, but it, it's a great thing to think about and I think everybody's situation is different and uh, you don't have to do the same thing with all your advisors because you don't use all your advisors the same. They have different expertises. So finding that right blend is a little bit of maybe trial and error. I don't know if, um, Ken, you have any? other thoughts around that? Yeah, no, that's a really tricky process because you, you do want people to feel invested in your company. You don't want to exploit people's goodwill either. A lot of people will go out of their way to help a young person starting a company. And some amount of that you, you should expect for free, but there's a point where if someone's really pitching in and willing to help you build your company, you want them to feel like they're part of the success of it as well. And you'll, you'll get better work from them in the long run. And your lawyers, lawyers will argue that, uh, you should have a solid agreement where you spell out the terms of their compensation and get them to agree not to disclose your secrets and all this stuff so you don't have a, uh, a so-called Winklevoss problem later where someone shows up and said, hey, I was with you from day one and I showed you everything about how to do this and now I own half your company. Whereas if you could say, look, we spelled this out very clearly. Here's the agreement that says you're, you know, you're going to spend two hours a week and you're going to get a half a percent of the company and, and you signed that and you went into this knowing what you were doing. Um, also knowing how high to reach. I mean, if you have a good relationship with a really famous person or a senior professor or something, you might twist their arm into putting their name on your advisory board. A smart customer or investor is going to look a little deeper than that. 
And if it's going to say, you know, I see you put Warren Buffett on your deck as your advisor, that just means because your uncle saw him once at a party and he smiled, or is he, is he really helping your company? So knowing when you want to drop a big name in there and when you can really get something substantive out of someone. Um, there's all kinds of fun things about when and how to put advisors together. So let's take one more question. If, um, I saw a couple hands up over here. Did I? Um, if not, um, oh, all the way back there, yep. Yeah, and I'm going to enter up there. I'll paraphrase the questions first. Um, one was, does, since this was developed at MIT, does MIT own this technology, and how does that work? That's actually a long, complex conversation, which I think Joe's going to have with you at various points throughout the next uh, couple days or weeks. And if you just Google the phrase tech transfer and MIT TLO, there's all kinds of stuff written about this. The quick answer is it's complicated, but it's done all the time. The, the other question, which I think we, we, we will focus on, and I'm looking for the slide where you showed the sort of supply chain of these um, people who make, uh, yeah, that one. Um, who's your customer? Is it the glass manufacturer? Is it these IGUs? Is it the homeowner? Is it the window company? Yeah, so, so our... It, in the residential, I'll make this as simple as I can. Uh, in the residential industry, actually, the glass manufacturer and the insulated glass manufacturer are the same. Um, so we look at selling to that entity. So basically, you can think of them as glass or the insulated glass manufacturer. And so we sell directly to them with an established process. Um, we t I talk about the like end consumer because it turns out that um, even though we're selling to this insulated glass manufacturer who's selling to a window company, who's probably selling to a contractor or a Home Depot who is ultimately installing it in your home, um, they, these insulated glass manufacturers are influenced by that end consumer. So part of what we had to do was first figure out how that chain flowed, then who is responsible for what part of the decision, and understanding how the end consumer influences these window manufacturers who ultimately influences um, is insulated glass manufacturers. And there's one level further than that, which is building code and things like Energy Star certifications or, or government influence, basically, which also has a huge driving force in this industry, but it's all tied back to that end consumer and, and what they can afford for that performance in their house. So that's kind of the reason why it's a complicated story. And we do understand like the, the most of the price breakdown on the way. Um, so I've, I've kind of simplified it, but yeah, it's super important to understand like who are you selling to, but who's making the decision? Um, and ultimately, it took a long time to understand that in this industry. And I could tell you that our like window industry is unique, but every industry has quirks and complications like that. So part of it is is the fun of getting to learn that, and uh, then you can spew off random facts about like oh I know who made that glass window because I can see the logo on the side. So. Yeah. yeah, knowing who the gatekeepers are at each of those stages, who has to approve of this or who could squash it. Um. Is, is key yeah. navigating that I'm sure you're in the middle of. Yeah, yeah I, we've done a significant amount of customer research just to understand the chain, uh, and that's because the window market is so huge. Like you can put two, you know, two homes next to each other, um, and they might have different windows for different optimum reasons, and then you get into completely different building types. And so it took us a long time just to get a lay of the land before we could start to figure out, you know, who are we actually? Who's got the biggest problem we can solve? So. Um, for us, that was probably a big part of the learning curve before we could really come up with this go-to-market strategy, which seems simple, like just sell to the manufacturers, but um, it took us a lot of iteration to get there and to understand exactly what we were providing to who and why. All right, so we're at time, so maybe um, I'll ask you to thank Richard and Elise. Um, um, and there's Yoast. Um, we'll stick around for a minute or two while we're shifting. We're going to turn it over to Joe. Do they get up and stretch, or are you going to take it over right now? No, we'll give, uh, how about uh, uh, ten, uh, nine minutes? Nine minutes, all right. So at 7.31, we, we can meet at 7.40. And come on down and do some informal Q&A if you want to talk to our, our founders here before they would go.